All right, it's our last talk of the day. It's my pleasure to introduce Polly Mitchell Guthrie. Polly, I think you're in Arizona, is that right? That is right. So Polly is a few time zones earlier than us. So I'll just let her know that we just saw a beautiful sunset out the windows here in Bethlehem and um, we are ready for a nice um, way to wind down that the afternoon um, with Polly's talk on supply chain. So Polly is VP of Industry Outreach and Thought Leadership at Canaxis. Um, she's also done worked in, in the past at University of North Carolina Healthcare System. She served in various roles at SAS. Um, she has an MBA from University of North Carolina and a BA in political science. Um, she's been very active in INFORMS, our professional society, and co-founded the third chapter of the Women in Machine Learning and Data Science organization, which now has more than 60 chapters worldwide. And from, I haven't known Polly that long, but I have known her already to be extremely generous and gracious with her time. She's been talking to students and giving guest lectures and classes and all sorts of things. And um, it's really great to have her here today. Polly, thanks. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. And I appreciate the invitation, Larry. So I recognize that I am the only thing between you and adult beverages and a reception. So I'm going to do my best to make this lively. And I also have the benefit of having uh, been able to catch up on uh, some of the, 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 I really enjoyed the last panel. So. I think what I'm speaking about today will be germane. So the first thing I wanna do, Larry knows, I like to start out with a, a pop quiz or since you all are all uh, uh, adults, I won't have to call it a quiz, but I'd like everyone to take a second and either write down or think about the answer to this question, which is what percentage of companies do you believe based on this MIT and Boston Consulting Group study receive significant financial benefit from AI? I have a big asterisk by AI because you'll, you'll see that uh, in the business community, AI is seen generally as synonymous with machine learning. I prefer to call it machine learning, but when I'm quoting something like in this case, it was called AI, I'll call, call it AI. So just take a minute and think to yourself, what percentage of companies do you think received significant financial benefit from AI? Okay, I had threatened Larry to, to do this, uh, make you all do live participation on the ground, but I'm gonna give you the answer and that's 10%. And if you're interested more in the, in the study itself, you, you, you can see the, the study here at the bottom from the Sloan Management Review. Uh, the reason I'm talking about this today is because I've seen similar numbers from other studies and it certainly reflects my own experience. And we have significant barriers for machine learning to have an impact. And given the deep technical advancements and the desire to have the advances you all are making, uh, those of you who are in academia make it into practice, the question is what is it gonna take for that to happen? The other thing I wanna highlight is the fact that AI maturity in supply chains is low. So MHI, the material handling industry and Deloitte do an annual study. And in their most recent study, they found 17% of companies have adopted AI in their supply chain. And that's actually a big jump. That's up 43% from the previous year. Now there's a, a big increase in interest in it. You, as you can see from the number on the right, ex digital transformation is really accelerating this. The pandemic has revealed the vulnerabilities. But the question is, what can we do to make sure this interest actually results in impact? So I'm gonna tell you just briefly actually uh, about why I think math is not the end of the line. Five abilities that are needed to really have the impact, talk about supply chains, wicked problems, and hopefully there'll be time for questions. So uh, I am in the desert where we do have beautiful sunsets. Uh, and just briefly, just a couple of things about Connexus, the company I work for. Um, the things I want you to take away from this slide are that we're focused on integrated business planning and digital supply chain. We're a global company founded in Canada. And in the chart on the right here, you see that we are ranked very highly in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, which means that we are rated as high on both having a vision for supply chain, as well as the ability to execute, meaning have an actual impact for our customers. And in terms of our customers, the point of this slide is just to let you know that the experience from which I speak today is based on a wide variety of very diverse industries and big companies that you've probably heard of. So that informs my perspective today. Okay, what do I mean by five abilities to assure machine learning has an impact? I'm gonna start by couching those abilities in the context of the analytics life cycle. The analytics life cycle is from the sort of, in this case, I'm drawing from the one from the Certified Analytics Professional Program. I was very involved in this program from its beginning. In fact, some of you may know Ann Robinson who recruited me to join Canaxa. She's our Chief Strategy Officer and is a past president of Informs. She invited me to get involved in this initiative. 
And what it's about is saying, if somebody practices analytics, and by analytics is sort of old school, but data science, machine learning, optimization, et cetera, what do they need to do? These are the seven domains identified as being critical to the practice of analytics. And what I wanna highlight for you is the fact that I've highlighted in red, the parts that I sometimes call the math, but the math is not at the end of the line. What you'll see is the math is smack in the middle. You have to start with framing the business problem correctly. And somebody answered in, uh, I heard on the panel, somebody was talking about, you have to even determine, is the problem that's being described even amenable to analytics? Sometimes it's a management problem. Do we have the data that we need? Data is always critical. I'm gonna talk a lot about deployment and maintenance uh, later, but the, the point is that all of these steps are critical for machine learning to have an impact. So what are the five abilities I'm gonna talk about today? I'm gonna to talk about how for machine learning to have an impact, it must be valuable, automatable, interpretable, deployable, and maintainable. So what do I mean by valuable? Well, literally value, it must generate financial value. It must generate a return on the investment. Um, the critical foundations of value, again, you can see my chart here of the, the analytical life cycle at the bottom. You have to start with business problem framing. You have to, have to make sure you're solving the right problem. And this is a lot harder uh, than it sounds. Their managers are often, I, I love this quote from Jeff Cam, who some of you may know from Wake Forest, spent many years at Cincinnati. He says that in his experience, managers are often better at identifying symptoms than really defining problems, defining the problem is critical. And then you have to engage the key stakeholders. If you do not involve the people, not only the executives, but the people who are on the line, like the example from Alibaba, you're not gonna have good results. And finally, you have to define the business benefits. What are we trying to achieve? And how will we know we've achieved it? By whatever we're trying to do. And I love this, uh, this study here from the International Journal of Forecasting from Files and Goodwin. They've studied the practice of, of forecasting uh, for many years, and they did, they did a case study based on many years of study at a supply chain company. And the question they were trying to ask was, why do planners continue to override results? Not unlike the Alibaba example. In this case, they were talking about a company that had implemented a statistical forecasting tool, which was gonna be certainly an improvement over the, you know, the judgmental forecast that had been previously happening. And yet planners kept doing overrides. In fact, according in one of their studies, some forecast had adjusted more than 90% of the time. In other words, they didn't take the, the statistical forecast, even though a third of those forecast adjustments were too small to have justified the effort. And what they found is that the forecasts that planners do in terms of overrides, they rarely add value, but they definitely add time. So they're taking away time that's inefficient and they don't necessarily add value. But people are not dumb, right? People are, people are gonna do what they're incented to do. People will do what they're measured on. And in this company, what they found is that the incentives did not really align. There was really no benefit to the planner to you having a more accurate forecast or other things that were measured on that mattered more. So again, this will, uh, the example from Alibaba is people will do what makes sense to them unless we give them a better reason and a clarity and we align with what the business benefits will be. Now, my favorite example of this is from Netflix. Some of you may remember that uh, in 2009, Netflix put out what they called the Netflix Prize. They were going to give a million dollars to any team that can improve by 10% their collaborative filtering mechanism for, uh, for recommendations. What you may not have ever heard is that they actually never implemented the algorithm. The winning algorithm never was implemented. They paid out a million dollars. Somebody was, was able to succeed but they never used it because in their blog, what they said is that they evaluated some of the methods, but the accuracy gains that they were going to get were not justified by the engineering effort to bring it into production. In other words, the value they were gonna receive did not exceed the effort to get it there. It's a lot of money to spend to not use something. And finally, I love this quote from Nada Sanders. Some of you may know Nada at Northeastern. She talks about how when you have AI and machine learning in an organization, it needs to be uh, align both vertically. If you're trying to do a demand forecast, you need to make sure that the, the demand side of the organization cares about it. But the demand forecast needs to go into a, a, a system or a network that is able to consume it horizontally as well. Because if you don't do that, you may have a beautiful demand forecast that you do not have the production capacity to, to produce. And if that's the case, maybe all you've done is create a highly efficient silo and local optima do not deliver financial results. Second ability, machine learning, in order to have an impact, it must be automatable. And I wanna be very clear when I say this because I heard some of the comments on the panel about keeping the planner in the loop. And I really wanna emphasize that 
we firmly believe planners have significant domain expertise. They, they need to be kept in the loop. The best use of machine learning is if we have machine learning and the planner paired and each can do what it does, he or she or it, as the case may be, does best. Uh, but planners are not data scientists. Um, I was at a conference a, a few months ago, a major supply chain conference, and a planner was giving a talk and she was a very experienced demand planner who'd worked in big companies with brand names you would recognize that I know have data science in other parts of the organization. Somebody asked her a question by, about Python and she said, what is Python? Think about that for a second. This demand planner, an experienced demand planner in a big company said, what is Python? Now, I would not have expected her to know how to program in Python. I would have expected her to hear from, hear, have heard of it. And so what that highlights is that data science talent is a constraint that clearly indicates not only is she not using Python, but she doesn't have people around her using Python. And in supply chain, that's what I commonly see. The data scientists, with, with some exceptions, are not heavily dominant on the supply chain planning side of the house. And so because of that, it's a constraint. We have to look for where we can automate. But what we want to do is automate the mundane. As I said, these planners have tremendous domain expertise. They know their space, but we don't want them focused on the tedious. So think about something like lead times. A car has, uh, on average, 30,000 parts. Having a planner manually update when the lead times have changed for each of those parts is a waste of their time. It's tedious, it's mundane, it's going to bore them, and they can't possibly get, keep up with it. So they make assumptions. Instead, what we want to do is automate that prediction as much as we can and then have it set parameters around it so we only flag for them the exceptions. But the value of doing this is that we don't want to just admire the problem. We don't want to just have an update that tells us, yeah, this part's going to be late. The planner needs to spend his or her time on the fact that not only is the part going to be late, but what's going to be the impact on production? What's going to be the impact on inventory? What's going to be the impact on distribution? What's going to be the impact on, uh, on customer on time delivery in full? So we need, if we automate a prediction, we've made a prescription and that prescribing a course of action is where we can really start to make a difference for an organization. Now, a key part of that is really enabling this automation is the growth of auto ML or automated machine learning. And this is just a depiction of how, uh, sort of a, a way we're trying to show of how we do it at Conexus. What you're seeing on the left is, is really essentially the planner. The planner is saying, okay, in this case, this is, this is a way we were trying to describe how we're doing demand sensing, taking machine learning signals into a statistical forecast. The planner, all they have to know is self-described schema. If they can think about a signal they'd wanna add and get it in the spreadsheet, on the right in the box, what you can see is that we can automatically ingest the data, do the data preparation, the feature engineering, the training and tuning, tuning validation, ensemble, what they get out on the other end is the results they care about. That's something they can use. There was a comment made earlier about whether or not the, uh, the planner cares about what's in the box. I don't think they care about what algorithms are used, but they do care about something, whether or not it's something they can trust, which is why interpretability is so important. I'm starting this slide with a comment about from a executive at a very large CPG company we're working with. And this executive said, Full stop, machine learning will not work without interpretability. And again, the, the planner doesn't care. Are you using gradient boosting? How are you tuning your hyperparameters? They wouldn't even know what those words mean, but they wanna get a result that they can trust. So we have to think about that planner who hasn't even heard of Python. What do we need to have in place so that she can consume the analytical results and will use them? Where we need to remember the, the classic Wolsey Swanson rule. People would rather live with a problem they cannot solve then accept a solution they cannot understand. They're not gonna use something they don't understand that doesn't make sense to them and we have to help them trust it. I've been very interested in this research around algorithm aversion by uh, Deep Force Simmons and Massey, who found that, that uh, humans are willing to forgive other humans that make mistakes in forecasting, but they're not willing to forgive algorithms. Human makes a mistake, they think the human made the mistake. Algorithm makes a mistake, they think the math is wrong, the math can't do the job as well as I can, I know what I'm doing. And we actually risk not having them just have a one-off uh, distrust of that particular instance, but full-on algorithm aversion. So they may not be asking what's in the black box, but they are definitely asking, how can I trust it? We have to give them ways to be able to understand it uh, so that they don't make workarounds like that they did at Alibaba that don't make sense. Now, there's lots of ways of getting interpretability, and I'm a big fan of Cynthia Rudin, and she's done tremendous work in this space for years, and so I'm so, so sorry to have missed her talk earlier today. But 
interpretability, explainability, what, what I'm ultimately getting at is we have to give people ways to understand and consume the results we're giving them. So we played around with SHAP diagrams, there's LIME, there's lots of other approaches out there. And I'm so glad that there's such interest in this space because it's critically, critically important. And I understand that uh, interpretability may not, uh, may not help you on the path to publishing and I'll talk more about that, but interpretability is essential for adoption. And so what you're seeing here is we're trying to make a chart that is simple so that the planner can, all they have to see is which signals were adopted. In this case, it's a demand sense forecast, a machine learning enhanced forecast that tell them which signals increase the forecast, which signals decrease the forecast, and which, which of the features that they or signals that they selected, what was the actual contribution or the value. So they can understand this. They don't have to understand the, the math under the covers. Okay, third ability. Third ability is deployability. We know that machine learning, and again, this was a question in the, on the panel here, offers greater accuracy, we love the precision. It also brings with it greater complexity. So I love this paper. It was a NeurIPS paper by, by Google several years ago on the hidden technical data machine learning systems. And what I wanna highlight here in this box is they're showing, this is what it took them, the infrastructure around machine learning code to get it into production. The math is only a very tiny part. So when you're seeing on the, the analytical life cycle at the bottom here is that, okay, we framed our problem. We figured out it's amenable to an analytical solution. We've gotten our data, we've done our math, and now we're at deployment. If we're gonna deploy a machine learning solution, it requires a tremendous amount of infrastructure. So the simpler the model, always the better. Uh, it's, it's always gonna be, because we don't wanna have a Netflix prize situation where we've built uh, a beautiful algorithm and we've gotten great results and we can't use it. And think about all these boxes here. The challenge with all these boxes is they cost a lot of money to build. So it better generate value if we're gonna use it. It doesn't mean it can't happen, but we, we have to have an ROI in order to be, it has to be valuable. And the valuable value comes from making sure that the math in the middle there and all the infrastructure around it generates more value or results than it costs to build the boxes. And part of the challenge to think about is deployment is not just into a model like this, which is auto, essentially automating and doing the feature engineering and the infrastructure around the machine learning, but it's actually being deployed into a much larger supply chain. This is what I sometimes call either the spaghetti chart or the, or the hairball. This is just a simple depiction, a very simplified depiction of what a, a supply chain might look like at a company. And what I want you to take away from this is you can see, first of all, there's multiple ERP systems, multiple parts of the supply chain, lots of spreadsheets, in fact, just as one example, when we did an implementation for Ford that wanted to be able to figure out how to build anything anywhere, they had a very regionalized supply chain. They had 10 plus legacy systems scattered around the globe, hundreds of spreadsheets, divergent processes, and they were trying to figure out how to have one global planning for their vehicle lines across the world. So when you deploy any kind of machine learning in a supply chain, keep in mind that not only are you gonna have all these boxes right here, but you're gonna deploy into a system like this that has, uh, it's gonna be in most cases now, digital transformation is accelerating some of this, but in most cases, it's gonna be a disconnected and legacy system. And the point of this quote here, this is from a former executive at Clorox who recently retired. All you have to really understand what he's saying here is that they realized that before they did digital transformation and connected everything, that if you had some errors in your data, your data was bad, it basically didn't propagate because it was disconnected. There's some value in disconnection. Once they connected everything, they got tremendous benefits, but an error mattered a lot. So they took a whole year out just to spend time on their data, which highlights the fact that a big part of the analytics life cycle, in fact, what any data scientist will tell you they spend most of their time on is the data. Which is why this is our system at Canaxis. Uh, this is sort of our equivalent of that Google NeurIPS paper. These are our boxes here. and so. The main things I wanna highlight are the fact that we have to deal with the data on the left. And of course, as I just said, the data is a, a big part of the problem. This is a cloud-based system. It's a machine learning as a, as a soft, machine learning as a service system. It's designed to be extensible and scalable. So what you see in the kind of main part of the box in the middle there is that we're gonna do the feature engineering and then we're, we're, we've got the pieces and parts in place for whatever problem we're trying to solve, whether it involves optimization, forecasting, uh, et cetera. And we can have very generic signals or we can have very signals, very specific, say to CPG versus say automotive. 
we're going to have real time inference. And, and then what you're going to see there on the right, where it says business logic or analytics, is that we're going to spit out the results into some worksheet, some interface that a, a planner can use and understand. They don't understand everything to the left, and they're probably not going to recognize any of the words on the right. And this is just giving you a sample of the fact that we use a wide variety of techniques. We use some of the newer machine learning techniques. We use classic uh, statistical and econometric models. We use um, optimization. We use expert systems, a wide variety of things. They're not going to know any of that. All they want is in their business logic or their analytics. They want a worksheet they can understand. Again, simpler is always better. And some of that is because of maintenance. For machine learning to have an impact, it must be maintainable because the job is not done at deployment. Again, go back to my life cycle here at the bottom. You have to have model life cycle management. Part of the beauty of machine learning is the precision it gives us. Part of the challenges or the ugliness is, is the brittleness of machine learning models. So they have to be monitored for drift. My favorite example of this is from an executive many years ago who told me of, of a problem that illustrates this at his company. At the time he was at a uh, travel and tourism company. This was a revenue management problem. They had a a forecaster, a data scientist who had built a model. And then he started deleting some of the seasonality factors in the application. He was tweaking it and playing with it and manually adjusting it and not telling anyone. He'd written the application in R, which at the time very few people knew. And, and he had no documentation on what he had done. And he left the company. The forecast started to degrade. They started producing bad optimizations and bad pricing recommendations. But the problem is no documentation. It took them months to figure this out because the forecasts were at the bid price level. And he said that it probably cost them millions, millions of dollars because of a model maintenance issue. Not the math was fine at one point, but it drifted. So Occam's razor, I really wanna highlight this. The simplest math is best. I loved this uh, fairly recent article, the first rule of machine learning, start without machine learning. He, uh, he does some research and he quotes lots of leaders in the field, including Google. Google has 43 rules of machine learning. Their number one rule, start without machine learning. And just to sort of hammer the point home, uh, the data science hierarchy of needs. What you're going to see here on machine learning is even almost at the top of our pyramid, when we get to A-B testing, we're still only using simple machine learning algorithms. We're not getting to do the fancy stuff like deep learning until the very top of the pyramid. But in terms of the hierarchy of needs, the, the, we could call it the you know, AI or the data science uh, high, you know, Maslow's hierarchy, is that we have to spend a lot of time on data, getting a good pipeline, anomaly detection, EDA, et cetera. So I'm now about to contradict myself, which is that supply chains are complex systems. Uh, it's very hard to predict and control them. And so we need powerful approaches. So I'm gonna, gonna give you an example that actually simple heuristics would not work for us. This is a, a problem we are currently dealing with now. We have an approach we've taken, but this is an example of where we, we need help. It's around how do you play? It sounds simple, right? You have a flyer that you get in your mailbox or you get at the grocery store or some kind of retailer. So how do you, what's behind building those flyers? So first of all, you have a machine learning model that's gonna look at all the data out there and try to give us forecasts. And then we have to take those forecasts for each product and we have to look at what are the possible combinations of products we could have in a flyer and, and uh, give us forecasts at the item level for those combinations. And then we have the user has a chance to specify, okay, what, what's feasible, what's realistic? What, we're not gonna uh, promote Coke and Pepsi, for example, in the same week. We're not gonna promote eggnog in October or uh, little bags of uh, bite-sized candy in February. Uh, and then we're gonna generate an optimal plan. And part of the challenge is that we actually have to do this six months at a time. So we don't take a classic time series approach. We actually have to do a machine learning model for this, of course, combined with the optimization. And what makes this so hard is not only, as you can imagine, uh, we have millions of combinations almost immediately, it explodes very, very quickly. And that's if we're only dealing with a small retailer. Um, so scalability is actually a, fit, a sixth ability I could have added, but I, I didn't do it. But in this case, scalability is a huge challenge. The math is hard, the scale is really hard. And this is a perfect example of where we'd like, this is the kind of problem we've actually gone to academia for help with, uh, but part of what we'll need for us to be able to help is for it to be able to scale and to consider all the other five abilities. Because if it can't consider those five abilities, it will not work. I can tell you that I've been a member of the Edelman Judging Committee for Informs for the last several years. And regularly I see applications from large companies who say, this problem is well studied in the literature, but 
And the but always has to do with the fact that some of these abilities are at play and it doesn't scale or work in their production size. And finally, I'll close with a, with a comment about wicked problems. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with West, West Churchman's commentary on this from many, many years ago. If you're not familiar with what he meant by when he was talking about wicked problems, he was saying that these are problems that are so difficult, we might even consider them mischievous or maybe even evil. So he's using sort of cute terminology here, but he's wanting to make sure that with the solution we propose is not worse than the symptoms. And what he's saying here is what can happen is we contain the growl, but not the actual problem itself. And when we do that, we may deceive the innocent, the, the, the management person, into believing that the problem has been tamed. And so what I wanna highlight here is that we will only tame the growl if we do the math and we don't consider the whole analytics life cycle. The problems have to be interpretable, maintainable, deployable, valuable, and uh, deployable as, and scalable in order to make an impact. In order for us to actually get at the wicked problem and not just tame the growl, we have to consider all those abilities. And finally, this is why we at CanAccess are big believers in partnering with academia. We believe strongly in industry academic partnerships. Our own employees publish, they're adjunct professors, they present at conferences, they, they uh, engage in patents, we engage in research. In fact, I'll, I'll highlight that we've, uh, we've just agreed to become an industry partner with the new AI for Optimization Center at, uh, based out of Georgia Tech. So we're really big, big believers in this. We want academics to help push the frontiers of what's what's viable with the math. And I think that the hybridization of machine learning and optimization shows tremendous a pro promise in terms of addressing these big problems we face, but we have to consider its practical implementation in order for it to make value. And with that, I would certainly say, uh, as, as Larry said, I first met Larry when I gave a guest lecture to his class. We have, a, in addition to the research partnerships, we offer guest lectures and case studies, and I invite you to, uh, to connect with us and, and to learn more. With that, I will stop sharing and be happy to take any questions. Okay, questions for Polly. The statistic you showed at the beginning, the 10%, seemed a little deflating, but it looks like there's a lot of investment your company's made in your platform, and there's a lot of things happening. What, how do you feel that statistic is going to improve and how quickly so that all this activity can be, can be successful? That's a great comment. I certainly have suffered from this from my own experience. Uh, my most recent job running in a hospital system, uh, University of North Carolina healthcare system. Sometimes you can take it so far, you can get good results and it doesn't get deployed. And again, that's why taking it all the way into line matters so much, even if you've got good math, good support, good results. Uh, so that's some of it. Uh, second thing I'd say is that I think things have changed somewhat in the last couple of years. As I said earlier, you can see other statistics. Uh, Gartner has predicted that by 2024, 75% of machine learning um, projects will move from piloting to operate, being operationalized. Now the question is what percentage of those will actually have an impact? But I really think, uh, I gave this talk for a reason. Like I think these practical considerations are really essential. Deep learning is, there's some really exciting stuff out there and it is generating results. But if you're not one of the, the you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, if you're most of the rest of the world, I can tell you that at uh, UNC Healthcare, when I said I wanted to do OR to help improve the, the throughput of patients through the hospital system, 99% of the people I dealt with thought that OR meant the operating room. So the awareness, and that's healthcare, which has the lowest uh, maturity out there, but I will say even in supply chain, when I talk to average supply chain planners and I pull them and I ask them, what are they doing with machine learning at their company? Most of them are just, they're, they're, they're barely getting started. So what we have to do is give them an on-ramp, give them a way to get going and see that machine learning can offer promise and opportunity. The digital transformation will give us better infrastructure for machine learning to have an impact. And then let's make sure we give it a chance to have an impact by making sure that we don't just jet in, uh, not listen to the, somebody asked a question about domain expertise of around the data, that's essential. Make sure you involve the planners in, in any model you're building. They know the data way better than you will ever, unless you're right there on the front line. So part of the, what the MIT study said is that what succeeded, those 10% of the models that succeeded were when there was strong organizational learning, the, 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 um, the math learned from the humans, the humans learned from the math, and there was change management. Great, thank you. Hi, you know, well, 
That's very strong. So in very interesting talk. So the question is, uh, isn't the 10% also associated with the way in which you ask the question? So AI is a very general uh, way of defining things. I mean, if you, when you were talking during uh, your presentation, you were talking about optimization, machine learning, and many, many things. So now if I ask uh, companies what is gonna be the impact uh, of uh, operation research, for example, in energy, I, I would say that 99% of them will say that there is an impact. So I'm not so sure about the 10% is actually really about uh, asking the right question. Yes and no. I can tell you that in the business world, people don't understand the distinction between AI, machine learning, operations research, et cetera. In fact, even uh, uh, Edward Rothenberg recently from you know, one of the founders of Garobi recently put out a paper arguing that optimization was an AI technique. And I, I seem to recall Mike Watson gave a talk at the Informed what? Analytics Conference earlier Sorry. this year making what? the same point. So was or was not? So what did Ed say? He said that AI, that optimization was part of AI. Yeah, I believe so. So, but my, my point is that, yes, I think terminology is part of the issue, but in general, sometimes I call it the fancy math just to demythologize it. And so the, I, I, my experience has been as a practitioner from talking to, to customers, to prospects, to leaders, is I don't think that number is far off. Again, you have to take it all the way to the end of the line. What you may sometimes be hearing about is yes, and this is across industries, keep that in mind. There are, there are absolutely point solutions of situations where you know, financial services firms, credit scoring would not be happening without machine learning, for example. Uh, there are industries that are ahead of the game. And you know, you, if you look at a Google, but I can tell you that uh, uh, deep learning is not widespread. Very few companies in practice are using deep learning. Uh, and, and it's really for all these kinds of reasons here. And in fact, there's a question, I'm seeing the question in the chat here about are there ways in which machine learning is hyped currently? And, the, and this, my answer feeds into that. Absolutely, 100%. The, there's uh, the other side of, of um, algorithm aversion is a, a dark side of algorithm appreciation, which is if people have a management problem, but they want to find a magic bullet solution, they'll say, let's go throw machine learning at it. Let's have a corporate AI initiative even if what they really should do is get their data in good shape. That might be the best thing they could do, but they, they think we need to have an AI initiative. I've taught a supply chain leaders who say they're being told to use machine learning. It's not what they need most, but their executives have told them they have to do it. Uh, and trust me, I wouldn't be out here talking about all this stuff if I'm not a big fan of machine learning and optimization. I think it holds huge promise, but we just have to make sure it has a chance to succeed and that we set expectations appropriately. And that's part of the problem. I mean, I don't want to uh, monopolize the conversation, but I actually think that the, the, the five uh, uh, pillars that you presented are very, very, uh, let's say, uh, shareable. I share exactly what you're saying, but the, the, still, I believe that the question about AI immediately polarizes over ML and deep learning, as you also said uh, a minute ago. And clearly, I totally agree that deep learning is not uh, currently more than 10% used. But the thing is that doesn't say that optimization is not be, is much more than 10% used. And as, as uh, uh, I mean, went all the way to actually solve many problems in industry that are currently solved all the time, including Gurobi, we're talking about how much is used, I think, for the companies uh, that are using Gurobi or Cplex or Express, I'm pretty sure that this, they will tell you that uh, in much more than 10% of the cases, this is actually useful for their business, right? Yes, and, and again, you know, I'm always suspicious. That's why I put an asterisk around my first reference to AI because have they really defined it appropriately? And even if they have, does the person responding to the question even understand the categorization they may have been, have been given? And the answer is, is typically not. But I still stand by my, uh, my statement that in my experience, I'm certainly familiar, I mean, supply chain is a part of the reason supply chain is so well adapted and studied by the optimization community is that it's a, it's a problem space that lends itself very well to operations research methods and techniques. Uh, and I can tell you that we hear from customers and prospects regularly that they have, they bought some uh, optimization technique and they're not using it, or, you know, model somewhere or there, some package and they're, and they're not using it. Um, so that's, that's the problem is, is uh, we have to figure out how to get that adoption and that success rate up. I totally agree. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, we'll thank Polly. Thanks so much for being here, Polly.
Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. All right, let me make a few last